Good morning. Welcome to St. Thomas Anglican Church. Beautiful day that the Lord has given us again today. We give thanks and praise for that. A little bit of warm weather, too, is always nice. We'll look at a few of the announcements that are in your bulletins. There are a few things that uh, happened this week or before next Sunday that are helpful to know. Uh, number one and two is that next week the baby bottles are due back. So if you have one of those, fill them up, put a check in, whatever the case, uh, whatever you want to do in terms of supporting uh, the ministry uh, there. And also vestry nominations are due next Sunday. So there is a box in the back and there's some slips of paper. If you'd like to nominate somebody for vestry, do that by next Sunday. The annual congregational meeting at which those vestry nominations will be voted upon is November 20th. So we have another three weeks, basically, until the congregational meeting. Uh, but those are due then. And also, do not forget, next Sunday, something is going to happen, and that is turn the clocks back. Right. Now, in the fall, things work out nicely so that, A, we get an extra hour of sleep, and B, if you forget to do it, you'll actually show up early instead of late. So if you're here next Sunday and you're wondering, where is everybody? Perhaps you forgot to turn your clock back. Uh, so we are doing that next Sunday as well. This coming Saturday, uh, the uh, sanctuary and, and uh, the altar guild is having its cleaning day at 9 a.m. So if you'd like to participate in that, uh, please do. Uh, you can also pray uh, this Saturday is the, is the um, annual convention for the diocese. So there'll be a lot going on on Saturday. But if you'd like to participate in helping get, getting things cleaned up and ready for uh, the upcoming Advent and Christmas season, that would be a big help to me. Um, one other thing, I guess, is that the cookie exchange is taking place on December 4th. The sign-up for that is by November 13th, so you have two weeks to sign up for the cookie exchange. Are there other announcements that I have missed? Yes. I stole your, I'm sorry. Make it again. It, it, it's second time around will be better. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily. I was actually thinking that I was going to lose an hour of sleep next week, so I had it wrong. It'd be nice to be getting an extra hour of sleep. It's always uh, helpful. Richard? Yeah, Richard is going to be, was it standing committee, I think? He got uh, elected by our district to be a representative. So that means that he has, I think it's four years of work to do with the diocese. So you can either congratulate him or give him your condolences. Uh, he'll probably take either one, uh, but he's done it before. So he is a veteran and is ready to go with regard to his service there. Right, right. you. Any other announcements? Let us then join together in prayer. Oh God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the beauty of this day which you have made, and Lord, we do indeed rejoice and are glad in it. We thank you for bringing us together this morning to worship your name and pray that that which we offer to you in our worship would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. 
For we come not clothed in our own righteousness or our own worthiness, but clothed uh, through the blood of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And it's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praying together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, as we live among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading from God's Word. Good morning. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, Who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates and have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, 
I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Our psalm today is Psalm 149. We will read it responsively by half verse. Praise the Lord. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Let Israel rejoice in the one who made him. Let them praise his name in the dance. For the Lord has pleasure in his people. Let the faithful be joyful with glory. Let the praises of God be in their mouth. And to, in their to inflict vengeance on the nations. And to, to bind their king in chains. And their that they may execute judgment upon arrival as it is written. A reading from 2 Thelosians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all of your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay, to repay with affliction to those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we will always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's the wrong song. Blessing. Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. 
particular to you, Lord Christ. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Blessing and honor, glory. pray. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, we pray, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I would imagine that the name Zacchaeus is not one that is new to you. And if you're like me, Zacchaeus was one of those people that I remember from when I was a kid. You know, there weren't a lot of things that I remember from Sunday school when I was young, but Zacchaeus was one of them. And I was, as I was trying to think, why might that be? I think it's because there was a song that went along with Zacchaeus. And songs have a tendency or they have the ability to really get things ingrained in our minds. And so if I were to say to you, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Very good. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Something for the Lord he wanted to see. And there are other verses. But that tends to put the whole story in mind. Uh, now, I would admit that when I think about uh, what I know of Zacchaeus, or without looking back in the scriptures, all I remember is this is a story about a short guy who climbed a tree and Jesus went and had dinner with him. But there's a whole lot more. I always just say, sermon over, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Uh, there's a little bit more going on here, and we're going to take a look at some of that. And one of the questions that you can have in your mind or think about is who really wanted to see who as we unpack this story a little bit? And so that's uh, something I think that we can answer in, in perhaps in two different ways. But we see that this story comes in the context of something else going on. And as Luke is presenting to us his account of the gospel, uh, we read back in chapter 18 that Jesus was now beginning intentionally with a mission as he has set his face to go to Jerusalem where he knows he's going to be crucified. Back in Luke 18, verses 31 and 32, we're told that Jesus took the 12 and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. We know from other gospel accounts that he was repeatedly telling his disciples that he was going to be going to Jerusalem to die, and they didn't get it. It didn't make sense to them. The Messiah was not going to be somebody who would go and be killed. If anything, he was going to be the one who was going to be doing the killing. You know, he was the one who was the great uh, warrior king who was going to lead Israel on to victory. And so the idea of Jesus, the Messiah, dying did not fit with their thinking. But that was Jesus' plan. 
That was God the Father's plan, and Jesus was executing it. And so Jesus knows now that he is beginning to walk into the very end of his life here on earth. And he's going there intentionally. It's part of what is going to happen as he offers himself up for the sins of the world. So it's in a larger context here. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. And we also see that he knows what's going to happen. This is all according to a plan that God has set and established. Uh, we also read in the end of chapter 18 of Luke that Jesus had just healed a beggar. And so that may be why it was that Nicodemus was interested in seeing Jesus, because we're not really told why he had in his mind that he wanted to see him and why he wanted to see him so badly. Now, he could have just said, oh, yeah, I hear there's Jesus is going to be coming through town. But he didn't have that attitude. He really wanted to see who Jesus was. And perhaps it's because he had heard that there just had been this miraculous healing that this guy Jesus had enabled somebody who was blind to be able to see. And there's a, a theme, I think, in here of the, the blind being able to see that takes place even as we're talking about Nicod or, uh, Zacchaeus himself. So I keep getting Nicodemus and Zacchaeus confused here. So Jesus is heading through Jerusalem, and Zacchaeus wants to see him. Now, last week we talked about the fact that tax collectors were despised, particularly if they were Jewish tax collectors, they were despised by the people of Israel. And we talked about that with the Pharisee and the tax collector who were praying before the Lord, and Jesus shocked everybody by saying that the tax collector was the one that went home justified rather than the Pharisee, who was supposed to be the one who was so righteous. And tax collectors, we said, were those who were known to be cheats. They not only collected the taxes that were due for Rome, but they also uh, collected a little bit of extra and lined their own pockets. And so tax collectors were not upright, fine citizens. And Zacchaeus was probably even worse than the guy that we talked about last week because we're told he was a chief tax collector. So not only was he doing this, and he was Jewish because Jesus said he was a son of Abraham, so he was part of the Jewish community. The Jews would have really hated this guy He's not only collecting taxes, but he's in charge of other people who are collecting taxes. And we're also told that he was rich. How did he get rich? Probably because he was fleecing people more effectively than the other tax collectors were. He was lining his pockets with the money that really was supposed to be theirs. But he was, as a, a cheating tax collector, was really good at his job. And so his wealth had come at the expense, probably, of a lot of the people who were there watching this whole event take place. So there is Zacchaeus, a hated guy, and he needs to take the extraordinary means of climbing a tree in order to see Jesus. He wants to see him, and because he's short, he's not able to see over the crowd. And you've probably been to parades. Sometimes you see this on the 4th of July. You want to see the floats and stuff going by. And so you might have some kids particularly climbing up uh, on light poles or on things that are along the route so they can see. Uh, sometimes kids are on the shoulders of their parents, but you want to get up high in order that you can see what's going on. And Zacchaeus figures he's got to do the same thing. He's short, so he's going to be down behind everybody, so he decides to go climb the sycamore tree. Well, he's up there in the tree, and Jesus is beginning to pass by, but one thing that doesn't happen is Zacchaeus is not up there calling out to Jesus. At least we're told, not told that he was. I don't think he was. He's not saying, yo, Jesus, look up here. Yeah, good, great to see you. He's just sitting in the tree. He's probably trying to find out more who is this guy that people are talking about who has healed people. But it's Jesus who makes the first move when it comes down to it. Because we're told that when Jesus is coming by there, he is the one who looks up. Verse 5 of Luke 19 says, when, he, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Had Zacchaeus not said anything, we don't know, or had Jesus not said anything, we don't know Zacchaeus would have. But he didn't. And Jesus looks up, and interestingly, this 
may escape our notice, but he doesn't say, hey, you in the tree. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. Now, how did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? We're not told, but the, certainly the story seems to imply that they had never met before. So Jesus knew him by some divine means, uh, and he called him by name, which is an important thing because the Lord calls his own by name. We talk about that whole idea of a shepherd calling his sheep, and his sheep know his voice. He knows them. And so Jesus knows who Zacchaeus is and calls him Zacchaeus, which would have really probably shocked Zacchaeus initially. How does this guy, who I have just heard about, know who I am? And, and Jesus then says, come on down. And lets him know that he's going to not only just talk with him, but that he's going to stay at Zacchaeus' house. We might think, well, that's a little bit forward. Here's somebody who's basically inviting him to somebody's, inviting himself to somebody's house. Zacchaeus hadn't invited him, Jesus. But Jesus has something in mind more than what Zacchaeus had had in mind. Zacchaeus just wanted to see who he was. But Jesus is going to do a whole lot more than that for Zacchaeus this day. And so we see, I think, in a couple different ways that really God is the one, Jesus is the one who has the plan and who wants to do some work in Zacchaeus. Even though we're told at the beginning that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, Jesus was intentionally wanting to see Zacchaeus. And so he initiates all of this uh, conversation and interaction that they have. And the fact that Jesus wants to go and stay at his house uh, would have been, again, scandalous to those that were there. And they, they do object. They grumble. Wait a second. This guy's going to go home and have dinner. He's going to stay at the house of a sinner? Zacchaeus, again, was hated. But that was Jesus' intent. It was not only to eat with Zacchaeus, which would have been scandalous enough, but actually to go and stay at his house. When somebody stays at a house, it indicates that there's a good relationship between the two. And for Jesus to have a good relationship with this lousy tax collector was a scandalous thing. But Jesus kind of gets at the whole point of things in the end. In verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It's those who are lost. It's those who are sick that need a physician. If we were all righteous, or if Zacchaeus was righteous, well, then Jesus really doesn't have to do anything. He could just say, go and enjoy eternal life. But the reality is that Zacchaeus was a sinner, as, as are all of us. And so Jesus makes the first move, and he is seeking and saving the lost. In this case, Zacchaeus. And it's really in that that I think we get a picture of the story for all of us with regard to salvation. Because we are all like Zacchaeus in the sense that we do not deserve to have God take notice of us or certainly to invite us or to spend time with us. And not only is he going to spend time with us, but he's invited us into his house. We take for granted the fact that we come here to church and that we're going to share a communion at the table of the Lord, where in the house of the Lord, God wants to sup with us. It's an amazing blessing that he's given to us, but something that we don't deserve. If you want to turn in uh, your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, I wanted to kind of walk a little bit through what's in Ephesians chapter 2 because it kind of relates to what goes, is going on here with Zacchaeus and Jesus and also relates with how Jesus deals with us. And so in the beginning of Ephesians 2, uh, Paul starts off there by saying, by referring to those who were dead in their trespasses and sin. We talked about in Sunday school today what happened at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, Adam and Eve ate from the tree, but they didn't keel over physically dead at that point in time. But we would say that there was a spiritual death that took place. They were separated now from God. And now they had a problem that they didn't have before because they had rebelled against him. There was a spiritual death that was not only for Adam and Eve, but was also for all of humanity. Paul says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
So when Adam and Eve ate from that tree, they ate in a sense for all of us, and all of humanity is in sin. As Paul else, elsewhere says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short, there's a little thing for Zacchaeus in there. He was short, and we fall short of God's glory. We cannot in ourselves merit salvation. And so God then has to also take notice of us if we are going to be saved. And Paul picks that up in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2. It says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See, if somebody is dead, if we had a cadaver here in the, the middle of the sanctuary, and I said, Come on, cadaver, get up! Believe in Jesus. Let me, let me try preaching really hard and see if he gets up. We're going to be standing here for a long time waiting. It's not going to happen. In order for the cadaver to do anything, he has to get new life somehow to be able to respond. And that's true of humanity. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sin are not going to believe unless God does a work first. And when he does that work, what we do in seeking him, as it were, is really responding to what he has already done kind of a mysterious thing, that even though there's a reality where we're seeking Christ, we only seek him because he has first sought us, which is difficult for us to understand, perhaps logically, but that's the way God works. Now, if you uh, turn in your Bibles for a minute, look at hymn 689. No, not in your Bibles, your hymnal, excuse me. Hymn 689, there's a hymn, first time I heard this, I said, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Uh, particularly in the first verse that's in here. But it, it gives expression to this reality that we kind of think we're seeking Jesus, but in reality, he's seeking us. So verse 1 of him 689 says, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true, no, I was found of thee. So the person who wrote this was saying, I was seeking the Lord. He was seeking the Lord. And that's kind of what Zacchaeus was. He wanted to see Jesus. But after he found the Lord, as it were, after he came in relationship, he realized that it was God who had moved, him soul to, moved his soul to seek him, seeking Jesus. So again, you might say, this is kind of making me dizzy. But the reality is that God does the work first. And then we respond to it in our wills to seek him out. We're not always aware of when he has done that first work in us. Sometimes people are, sometimes they are not. I mean, I, that the uh, new birth, being born again, is really uh, being born from above. God has to give that new birth, and then we respond to Christ. And I, I'm sorry to, I apologize to my wife in advance because... I didn't tell her I was going to do this, and I hadn't planned on doing it because it didn't come to me until this morning's sermon at 8 o'clock. But uh, the way this worked out in my own life is I really didn't care all that much about, uh, you know, I went to church, but really didn't believe the Bible was true. I uh, thought it was a lot of words written by men about somebody. Um, and then I was working in the bank, and I saw this interesting-looking cute teller that was working in there. And so I asked this teller out on a date. And uh, it was on the date where she asked me if I was a Christian. And I said, well, yeah, I go to church every Sunday, but I knew she was asking something a little bit different. She was probably one of the, I think I've said this before, these crazy born again people. But, oh no, one of these rabid extremists. Oh. But God had me interested enough in her that I continued to go out. And so there was a sense that what I was seeking, what I thought I was seeking, was uh, a relationship with a teller. In reality, God was using all of this as he was seeking me. Because he knew and had really already planned out that what was going to happen is she was going to get me to start going to churches where they preached actually out of the Bible instead of out of psychology today, which is where I had heard most uh, sermon quotes come from in my upbringing in the Methodist church. And he knew that as I started to hear the word, 
that I was going to be converted and would come to faith in Christ. So in reality, he was seeking me, and perhaps you, I would imagine, as you look back over your life and recognize the point when you came to truly trust in Christ, believe that he was God, that he was the one who saves, that you could see throughout your life before that happened that God had orchestrated a whole lot of events in order to get you to that place. If I had not seen this interesting-looking teller, a cute teller, in the bank. I don't know where I'd be today, but probably would not be here because I was not interested in going into ministry. I was not interested really in taking God that seriously. But as I was seeking her, it was really him seeking me. And eventually, I found Jesus because he was always after me the whole time. Jesus said he was the one who comes to seek and to save the lost. That worked in me. It worked in Zacchaeus. And that's the way it works with all of us, that God's doing the seeking. And you could, we can say something that doesn't make logical sense, but I ch chased after, or I chased after, I, Jesus chased after me until I found him. I mean, that is the reality of the way things work out, is he's, he's seeking us just as he was seeking Zacchaeus in order that he would save us. And it's not a saving that we deserve Later in Ephesians 2, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, that no one may boast. We can't say, God chased after me, Jesus chased after me, because I was such a nice guy. He chased after us despite our sin, because we are still all sinners. And we thank God for the fact that he was gracious to save us. And it's not as though what we do is unimportant, but what we do is we do works for God after he has already saved us. Uh, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 2.10 that we are saved unto good works, which he has prepared in advance for us to walk in. So when God grabs a hold of us and changes us, there is a real change. And we begin then to think differently and act differently. And we see that that's exactly what happened with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus makes a declaration uh, after Jesus has reached out to him. In verse 8, it says, Zacchaeus stood and said, Behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Zacchaeus had a new perspective on life. And he wasn't doing these things in order to get Jesus to notice him. Jesus had already noticed him. He did these things because he realized that God was doing something amazing in his life. And so as a rich man, he was gonna take half of what he gave, half of what he had, and give it to the poor. Scriptures tell us to care for the needs of the poor, and he was gonna do that. And because he had defrauded people, he says that he, if he has defrauded anyone, he's gonna restore it to them fourfold. So if Zacchaeus had been your tax collector and he had fleeced you for $100, he's now gonna give you back $400. Zacchaeus' life was changed. He began to act differently because of what Jesus had done for him. We, like Zacchaeus, are sinners. God has chased us down until we have caught him, and our lives are changed. Thanks be to God. The things that we do, we do for his glory, for his honor, and in thanks for what he has done in us, in saving us, because we, too, were lost, and yet he has found us. He has sought us and he has found us and made us his own children, part of his family and part of his kingdom, which is why we come here today to give worship to his name and to celebrate with him as we join together at his invitation to his table to share a meal with him. What a blessing we have received. Let us pray. O oh God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that despite ourselves, you, O oh Lord, have sought us and have saved us by your grace through faith not in our works but in the works of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, may our hearts respond with joy as Zacchaeus' did, that we would give ourselves over to you, that we would be used by you in your kingdom to do those good works which you have prepared for us to do. 
And Father, we give you all the thanks and the praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our faith together by standing and reciting our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join together in the prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, for the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, for the primates of the Worldwide Anglican Communion, the Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America, for our Bishop Alec, Cameron, and Tamara, our Interim Rector, Father Greg and Lori, Assisting Clergy, Father Terry and Mary Ann, and for all missionaries, especially the Reverend Allison Barfoot in Uganda, Epiphany Ligonier, the Church's Ministry Among Jewish People, the Provincial Office, Church Army, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, for all who teach and disciple others, and for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for all the men and women in our armed forces at home and abroad, defend them day by day with your heavenly grace, Strengthen them in their trials and temptations, and give them courage to face the perils that beset them, and help them to know that nothing can separate them from your love. Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our Congress, Supreme Court, and President Joe Biden. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Norm and Ruby Hayden, Pat Roberto, Judy Eves, Joe Kosarek, Marissa Sharkey, Joni Mater, Mary Egger, Juliana, Tim, Jim, Kathy Vemdevort, Steve, Debbie Babcock, Joseph Babcock, Rebecca Ford, Ola, Alexa, Les and Gladys, Maria, Kristen Casavell, Phyllis, Emily Tedeschi, Timmy, Jessica, Tracy, Johnny Morales, Randy Borges, Mary Garrison, Dolores Glenn, Jan, Kathy and Don Harris, Delaney Price, Tony Visconti and the Visconti family, Melissa Swachak, 
Mickey Washburn, Aria, Joey, Katie, Chef Ben, Susan W., Monica, Judy, the Garrison family, Father David Wilson, Clayton, Jason, Karen, Lisa Erb, Clyde Rodas and family, Rick Wells, Gloria Dramble, Colton, Mary, Mindy, the O'Connell family, Father Mark Brown, Joey, Ron and Valerie, Ellen, Tina, Eric, Bryce, Penny, John Colaney, Betty Alcher, Leah, Maria, Kayla, Mike, Michelle, Carter Cox and family, Deb, Norma Snyder, Ben Babcock, Ann Payton, Emily, Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, especially, Lord, in your mercy, we thank you for all the blessings of this life. Lord, in your mercy, for our vestry and wardens, Dave and Manny, that as your appointed leaders, they may faithfully serve you and this church. Lord, in your mercy, O God of patient and gentle strength, who knows our needs even before we ask, may your loving presence guide us as we seek the next rector for St. Thomas. Give us an open spirit, discerning hearts, and clear minds, that we may trust your will for us and become ever more united in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Inspire our conversation, deepen our prayer, and make us a community of humility and grace. Raise up for us, we pray, a priest and pastor who will boldly proclaim your gospel, faithfully administer your sacraments, and serve your people with love and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially, Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with a sign of peace.
birthdays and anniversaries. Are you taking this one, John? Sure. Okay. <laughs> there are uh, some birthdays today, or tomorrow. Right. Father Ron being one and me being the other. We both have our birthday on the same day, as does Archbishop Foley Beach. Oh, so we are in some good company. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> is anybody else having a birthday today? Anniversaries. Well, we, uh, I guess, should Father Terry come up at this point? Because yeah. we're also, this is also Pastor Appreciation Sunday. So uh, we not only get birthdays, but other appreciation as well. It's a, uh, a double blessing. <laughs> so we just wanted to take a minute to say thanks to Father Greg and Father Terry for uh, being here with us and, and leading us each Sunday um, and being a clear guide for us in faithfulness. Child, O oh Lord, as his days increase, bless God, wherever he may be. Strengthen him when he stands. Comfort him when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise him up if he falls. And in his heart, may your peace, which passes all understanding, abide all the days of his life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I was going to say, Father Terry's been here a little bit longer than I have. I, I get two months in. He's got, I don't know, how many uh, decades in. So thank you, Father Terry, for your faithful service. Let us prepare our hearts for the offering and for Holy Communion <coughs> as we hear from God's Word in Galatians chapter 6. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us present unto our Lord our tithes and our offerings.
have we given thee? The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subjects to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he even thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord, with the heart of thanksgiving. I will bless thee, O Lord, with my hands lifted up and my mouth. Join us on page 81 of your songbook, page 81.
together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us that we are true members of the mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah.